Psych Soch, again, is one of those that that has lots of points that are up for grabs. You just got to know some definitions and understand what's going on. Dorothy, back for some more MCAT podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to jump into another passage with you uh, for Blueprint MCAT Full Length 1, which we've been covering for the last several months. And everyone, as a reminder, can get it for free at blueprintmcat.com. So we're jumping into another passage. Last week, we uh, I struggled with some of the discretes there. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we can pick it back up with our next passage. So let's go ahead and jump into our passage and awesome. start. All right. So this passage was definitely one where I had to employ some active reading techniques just to stay focused. But let's go ahead and dive in here. So passage six, optical illusions illustrate several principles of human perception. People rely on past experience when perceiving images, even when they are incomplete. This reliance on past information allows individuals to quickly interpret what is being seen. This phenomenon is illustrated as follows in the Kaniza Triangle. And we're given an image there of the Kaniza Triangle in figure one. You can see some kind of incomplete lines, but it looks like there's two triangles overlaid on top of each other, one completely white with no outline, and the other one has a black outline as well. We've got some circles around them. As well. So kind of, you can see the optical illusion there as well, just looking at that image. It looks like there's some sort of 3D element, even though it's all on one 2D screen. All right, so from this paragraph, I'd probably highlight a little bit, um, you know, relying on past experience to perceive images in that second sentence there, um, even when they are incomplete. And this is what helps us to quickly interpret was being seen. So I'd probably highlight that quickly interpret clause as well. Amazing. All right, let's keep moving along. So next paragraph, another optical illusion that invokes previous information are those that involve depth perception. Two same size figures are placed so that it seems one figure is closer to the viewer than the other figure. The figure which is judged to be farther back appears bigger than the one that seems closer. So this paragraph is talking about depth perception. I would probably highlight that. And we're given an example there where one is, um, they're, they're two same size figures. So I'd probably highlight same size, but one looks closer. Yep, so what it seems one figure is closer. Exactly. It, it's reading that it, I'm confused on on how that reads there. Two same size figures are placed so that it seems one figure is closer to the viewer than the other figure. So that it seems like it? It seems like the figure which mm -hmm. is judged to be further back appears bigger than the one that seems closer. To me, that's opposite of what <laughs> you would assume, right? The bigger one is going to be the closer to you than the further one back right. if they're the same size. So something is off there in the way yeah. that I'm interpreting it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so we have two same size figures, one looks closer. You definitely would expect the one that looks closer to be bigger. However, they are the same size. So the one that looks further back, then because they actually are the same size, we are um, also adding that layer of depth there. So because of that, it actually does end up seeming that the farther one looks bigger because we perceive it as being farther back. And because of that, it looks bigger relative to what we'd see if it was closer to us. Okay. I don't know if that it, helps it, at all. No, but. They, they, because it, they're, <laughs> if they're the same size, then if one's further back, it's going to look smaller. That's just how our eyes right. work. So right. if, if, if it's saying that one is placed further back, but they're making sure that they continue to look the same size, then I would say, okay, yeah, then the, the back one seems bigger. But anyway, yeah. let's let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help that they don't have an image or graphical yeah. interpretation of that here. Yeah. All right. Next paragraph. People typically perceive depth through stereopsis, in which binocular neurons in the striate cortex respond most strongly when visual information is perceived in slightly different locations in each eye. This perceived difference in location is called a retinal disparity and contributes to depth perception. 
These processes are also influenced by other cues, such as loss of clarity in objects farther away or objects appearing to move faster when a person turns their head. So we're still talking about depth perception here, but a little bit more specifically to what happens um, in terms of the neurons as well. So here we have um, people perceiving depth through stereopsis. So that's a new term to me. I would probably highlight that. And keep, and they also help us by italicizing the binocular part. So binocular means two eyes, two ocular neurons um, in the striate cortex. So I'd probably highlight the binocular part, maybe even the striate cortex part as well. And then we also have a new term in retinal disparity. And so this is the perceived difference in location in each eye. I would probably highlight at least the term. I can always look to the surrounding areas for the definition if I need it. And then in the last sentence, we also are given some other cues that can help with depth perception as well. So we've got loss of clarity. I would probably highlight that as well as things appearing to move faster yep, when someone turns their head. Great. Next paragraph. Optical illusions can involve color perception. If a person stares at a green image and then looks at a white background, the previous image appears as a red residual image. The cones of the retina responsible for perception of green are activated when staring at the image initially and after staring these cones, and after staring, these cones become desensitized. When the person then looks at the white background, white combined with the absence of perception of green gives a perception of a red residual image. All right, so now we're talking about color perception. So we've moved beyond depth perception. I'd probably highlight color perception in that first sentence here. And we're given this kind of red residual image phenomenon. So I would probably highlight that part. And to describe this, we're saying if someone stares at a green image for a really long time and then quickly goes to look back, back at the white background, they see, tend to see this residual image happen. And so I'd probably highlight why this might happen. So we see the cones in the retina are activated and then become desensitized. So I'd probably kind of highlight the, um, the sequence of events that happens here. And then that desensitization at the end, yep. And then we're given another kind of another reword of that phenomenon. So when someone looks at the white background, white combined with the absence of perception of green gives that red residual image. So you could choose to highlight some part of that last sentence um, if you are still feeling unclear on that residual image phenomenon. Yeah. All right. I think last paragraph here before we go to our figure. So a study was conducted to, to determine the effect that the length of time staring at an image had on the perceived intensity of the residual image. Groups of 10 individuals each viewed a green image for 20, 40, or 60 seconds. They then rated the intensity at which they perceived the residual image at 10 second intervals for one minute. The averages of each group at each time point are presented in the line graph as follows. And we're given a line graph in figure two. So before we look at the figure, I just want to make a note of the things that um, we read about in this last paragraph. So now we're introducing our study and the study is looking at the effect that the length of time staring at the image has on the perceived intensity. So I would probably highlight the bulk of that first sentence there. And then we're given um, the 20, 40 and 60 second time frames as well. And they are rating the intensity. Um, so it's kind of a subjective rating for the intensity values there. All right, let's take a look at figure two. So we are told in the figure description that this shows the intensity of the residual image over 60 seconds based on exposure time to the original image. And I'm seeing three lines on that graph. So we've got a really small dotted line. We've got a larger um, dashed line, and then we've got a black solid line as well. And we're told in the legend that the um, small dots are 20 seconds, the dashes are 60 seconds, and the black line is 40 seconds. All right, and so when we look at figures, we kind of want to do a couple of things. So we want to look at the figure description, kind of get oriented with what information is given in the figure. We also want to look at our variables and our axes. So on the x-axis, I'm seeing length of exposure to image. So we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 second intervals at which these participants essentially gave us their ratings of intensity. 
On the y-axis, we've got intensity. So that is our dependent variable there on a scale of one to 10. And then we also just want to look at our legend to make sure we understand which lines are what, and then we can kind of translate all of that into a story here. So Ryan, what are some things that you're noticing about the shape of those lines relative to each other? So they seem like they start off the first uh, 20 to 30 seconds or so. Mm -hmm. They're all very similar, very close together. And yeah. then we see the 20 second exposure group drops off pretty quickly after 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. And the 40 to 60 seconds, I would say is basically the same. Uh, mm -hmm. They kind of end the same. Yeah. There's there's a little bit of wonkiness between the 40 <laughs> and 50 second. There's a, there's a big dip there. Um, right. I, I would venture to say that the 40 to 60 second, we, we've, make, we've reached some sort of max desensitization yeah. with the 40 seconds that 60 seconds doesn't really add much to it. Yeah, I think that's a perfect interpretation of that graph because really the 40 and 60 second lines are basically on top of each other the whole time. And so there is some sort of threshold apparently for desensitization of those cones. So, awesome. Yeah. All right. With all that fun, we go into the questions and try to have some more fun. Uh, all right. Question 31. It can be inferred from the results of the study that 20 seconds is sufficient time for what to have occurred in green cones in the retina? A, desensitization. B, residual image. C, binocular vision. Or D, excitation. All right, so binocular vision has nothing to do with this, right? That was the uh, <laughs> the uh, depth perception, not color. The color perception one, we have highlighted quickly that cones in the retina are activated and that staring, uh, after staring, these cones become desensitized. Right. And it's the desensitization that gives this perception of the red image when they go back, right? Because they're mm -hmm. no longer being able to see that. So exactly. Uh, answer choice A seems like that is just straight out of the passage, is desensitization of the green cones. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's making that happen. Great. Yep. It's A for sure. Um, I think a lot of students sometimes get tempted by B and D, and those are both wrong for their own reasons. So residual image is what happens. That's the phenomenon that happens because of the desensitization of the cone. So it kind of switches up the causality there. Mm -hmm. And then D, excitation. So excitation, of course, happens when you look at a green image, but we're asking specifically about that 20-second time frame in terms of that perhaps threshold for desensitization. The fact that you see a residual image after 20 seconds shows that they are way past the point of excitation. They have been desensitized at that point. Yep. Question 32, a possible explanation for results found in the study is blank. So A, there was a difference between groups in the number of green rods desensitized after 20 seconds as opposed to 40 or 60 seconds. B, there was a difference between groups in the number of green cones desensitized after 20 seconds as opposed to 40 or 60 seconds. C, there was a difference between groups in the number of green cones desensitized after 40 seconds as opposed to 60 seconds. And then D, the group who viewed the green image for 40 seconds must have had, on average, more sensitive green cones than the group who viewed the green image for 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> All right. So, um, answer choice A is putting the two groups, the three groups into two buckets. And uh, yep. 20 seconds and 40 and 60 seconds, which we've kind of said already when mm -hmm. we looked at the graph that said there's obviously a difference between 20 seconds and 40 and 60 seconds. So yep. answer choice A is tempting. I'm going to uh, reread, though, because the biggest difference is rods and cones. And so a lot of students are going to choose A because it's the first one there, mm -hmm. but nowhere have we talked about rods. And so... It's, that seems to me is like a, a trick question because we're talking about cones here. The cones are yeah. being desensitized. Um, so answer choice B is more correct than A just because of that simple change in wording there. Um, and then answer choice C goes against kind of what we were saying. The graph tells us that there's really no mm -hmm. difference between 40 and 60 second groups. 
Yep. And then answer choice D again is the same thing. Like it's it's saying there's a difference between 40 and 60 seconds and we have said no there isn't. So I'm going to go with B here. Great job. Yep, that's the answer. I think also rods, you know, green rods aren't a thing, right? Rods are kind of more sensitivity in lower light conditions, more yep. per peripheral vision, whereas cones are more for color perception. So yes. blue, green, and red cones. Yes, exist. it's a sim simple mnemonic that everyone should remember. C, C for C, right? Cones for color. Yep, exactly. All right. I, I still remember that to this day. <laughs> it stuck. <laughs> I, something worked. So much useless knowledge in this head of mine. <laughs> All right. Question 33. It can be inferred that a person who has lost sight in one eye will come to predominantly use which of the following type of information to perceive depth? All right. So we know the <laughs> it's a Roman numeral. Answer choice, uh, mm -hmm. Roman numeral one, binocular vision. Answer choice two, cl the clarity of objects and uh, room number three, retinal disparities. So answer choice one and three both rely on having two eyes <laughs> so <Yep. laughs> answer choice two roman numeral two is the only one that you can do with one eye so i'm gonna go with b2 only amazing great job <laughs> come on people this is straight straightforward <laughs> come on all right 34. All right, 34. When a subject views the word red written in green ink, it takes longer for the subject to recognize the word than when viewing the word red written in red ink. This phenomenon is known as blank. So now we've got our terminologies here. So A, <laughs> the James Lang theory, B, cognitive dissonance, C, attribution theory, and D, the strope effect. Yeah, so... <sighs> I don't know James <laughs> Lang theory. I don't know the strobe effect. Uh, attribution theory, I'm not sure. Cognitive dissonance just seems like a, an easy one that I'm going to pick because I don't know any of the other ones. Just mm -hmm. the cognitive dissonance is I see green, but I'm reading red. And so there's that dissonance there that's going to slow me up. So I'm just going to go with B, not knowing any of the definitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so B actually is not the correct answer. I can definitely see why I think it also is one of the more tempting ones that students often fall for. But cognitive distance, again, is kind of like contradiction between be two beliefs that beliefs or attitudes that you have. And so if we're looking at this, if we're kind of looking at this question stem, it essentially says you have red written in green, and it's a little harder for our brains to process that because we've got two color words um, that are associated there. And so that is actually the strobe effect, which kind of describes that to a T. So strobe effect is when it is just harder for someone to reconcile two different pieces of information that are both color related. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if we look at the other ones, though, this is a great one for process of elimination, I think. So James Lang theory is one of the emotion theory. So even if we're not completely sure about James <laughs> Lang versus Kenan Bard versus Shakter Singer, that's emotion, which isn't really relevant to the situation here. Um, attribution theory is kind of like when you're driving in traffic and you cut someone off, you're like, oh, I have to get to the hospital. That's situational. It's understandable. But when someone else cuts you off, you're like, oh, they're a horrible person. They must not care for the safety of others, things like that. So it's kind of giving yourself more grace in terms of looking at your situational factors because you know that your own situation versus assigning more dispositional traits to other people um, when they do something wrong. All right. Mm -hmm. The strope effect. That's the strope effect. It's a new one. A new one we'll remember for the future. All right. So another <laughs> passage down. Um, we did pretty well. Did I? Did I get all but one? I think all but one. Yeah. All but one. So not not too shabby this week. Um, <laughs> Psych Social again is one of those that that has lots of points that are up for grabs. You just got to know some definitions and understand what's going on. Uh, whenever I see students that, that left points on the table, they're like one, 129 chem phys, bio, biochem, maybe 127 cars, and then 125 psych social. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> like, that's the one that should be easy. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully this is helping students get those easy points. <laughs>